uh, MIT, Harvard, and McGill University. When uh, my parents named me Khaled, and my name turned out to be Khaled Salawi, little did they know that one day my name would match the name of a wanted Jordanian criminal. <laughs> I discovered this when I arrived to Jordan as, as an adult for the very first time in 2005. The Jordanian immigration official took my Canadian passport, entered my name in his very modern 1992 Pentium 1 computer, and then said bluntly the most welcoming word that can be said in the Arabic language. It's study. <laughs> Which in English translates into take a seat, but for experienced travelers to the Middle East, they know it means you're screwed. <laughs> I was of course detained and Jordanian immigration officials would spend the following hours trying to figure out in fact if I was this true wanted Jordanian criminal using what appeared to be a highly sophisticated technique of blowing Marlboro smoke rings and staring into Turkish coffee cups. And this is in spite of the fact that I spent my whole life in Canada, and the only information they had about this criminal was his name. No date of birth, no place of birth, nothing but his name. Unfortunately, my experience, my experience set the tone for what I was to witness as an entrepreneur in the Middle East. Although the youth of the Arab Spring courageously confronted some of the leaders in the region, miraculously overcame their intimidation, they still have many challenges ahead of them, as the policies of their former leaders will take years to undo. One of those policies, which is rarely spoken about, is energy intensity. A good way to measure the energy efficiency, or sorry, energy efficiency, a good way to measure the energy efficiency of a nation's economy is to look at something called energy intensity, which compares the total energy consumption of the nation with their gross domestic product. Well, as it turns out, the energy intensity of the MENA region is 40% higher than the world average. While developed nations experienced a decline in energy intensity since 1980, the only region in the, in the world that experienced a grow, a, a, a energy consumption grew faster than GDP is the Middle East and North Africa. This means that the people of the MENA region are consuming far more than they are actually producing. I think it's time to cut back on the production, <coughs> which would actually mean a decline in the production of natural gas. <laughs> when it comes to the energy used for transportation, it's even worse. The MENA region is the most transport energy intensive region in the world. 13% <coughs> more transport energy intensive than the US and Canada combined. 65 more transport energy intensive than the world average, and nearly 350% more transport energy intensive than China. And CNN thinks we still ride camels. We ride gas guzzling hummers for no reason at all. In the Palestinian territories, where I'm from, and where things tend to happen in a more acute manner, we face an even larger energy crisis. As the son of Palestinian refugees who were fortunate enough to immigrate to Canada, I was raised on the imperative that if we Palestinians who are lucky enough to grow up in the most progressive societies in the world and receive education and amongst the best institutions in the world, if we don't go back to Palestine to help out, then who will? Currently, Palestine has one of the world's highest population densities, higher than any country of similar geographic size and significantly higher than most countries around the world. In 2020, due to Palestine's high population growth rate, Palestine's population density will increase dramatically. In 2050, it is expected to surpass Bangladesh. To make matters worse, Palestinian people pay amongst the highest energy prices in the entire Middle East and North Africa. They have no source of natural energy and are completely dependent upon the Israeli occupation for supply. Energy in Palestine has become unaffordable for Palestinians. This is a situation that is unsustainable. It was this extreme situation that drove us to take our heads out of the ground and look at alternative forms of energy to provide for Palestinians, while at the same time trying to create a more sustainable economy for Palestine. So what did we do? We put our heads back down in the ground. Two meters deep, actually. 
and utilize the clean, renewable energy known as geothermal energy, which can provide a source of heating and cooling for any type of building. We installed many geothermal systems in Palestine. They use the stable temperatures in the earth to provide heating and cooling, while saving 70% on their energy consumption. We lowered costs to make them affordable and lowered the payback period to be between four to six years. These geothermal systems are eliminating the carbon dioxide emissions that would have been produced by the standard fuel burning heating systems widely used in Palestine. We were driven by our belief that developing countries are in fact in a unique position to incorporate renewable energy in their new constructions and actually build right. And our vision for building right was finally realized on a massive scale when we were awarded the contract to install a 1.6 megawatt geothermal system at the American University of Medeba in Jordan, the largest geothermal system in the region. Our geothermal system will now save a combined 300,000 kilowatt hours of electricity, 140,000 liters of diesel fuel, and 310 carbon dioxide, uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions every single year. In spite of this, I still have to prove I'm not a criminal every time I enter Jordan. <laughs> This is the effort of a small Palestinian green energy business that faced enormous obstacles. We were trying to keep Palestine cool from the ground up. I guess it worked since a representative from the Israeli Ministry of National Infrastructure sent us an email saying, quote, I'm impressed. It looks like we have a lot to learn from you. <laughs> Palestine TV was also very excited when they referred to me as, quote, the inventor of geothermal. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority did not send me an email because they're still learning how to use email. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much potential for what can be done to improve energy efficiency in the Middle East and North Africa. However, the policies that exist discourage investment in renewable energy, such as the very high energy subsidies which account for 7.1% of the region's GDP. Energy subsidies, like the ones in the Gulf states, Syria, and Egypt, are encouraging people to, you know, to experience rampant energy consumption because energy is so cheap, while providing no financial incentive to save money. Even you know, conserving electricity was even recognized by the late Muammar Gaddafi, who stated, were it not for electricity, we would have to watch television in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Another chronic obstacle that we, that we face and we constantly face in the region is, of course, bureaucracy. Before we can start working on the American University of Matnaba geothermal system, the Jordanian government required us to receive approval from the Ministry of Public Works and the Ministry of Industry and Trade and the Ministry of Interior and the Jordanian Intelligence Agency and the Prime Minister's Office, the Ministry of Water, the Ministry of Energy, and the Jordanian Contractors Union, and the Jordanian Engineering Association. We were just thankful that we weren't required to receive approval from the Jordanian Manly Mustache Association. <laughs> <laughs> Our small green energy business was required to pay salaries and overheads and put our equipment and employees on hold for five months while waiting for approvals, which essentially removed the profit from this project. The Middle East and North Africa region is one of the most energy inefficient regions in the world, and for decades, government, Arab governments have been doing nothing about it. When I arrived to the Middle East, I wondered, is it possible for us to lower unemployment, to improve our energy efficiency, while our governments are not for us and by us, but rather for kings and sheikhs by Britain and France? Oops, I forgot to remove that out of my speech. <laughs> In spite of the obstacles that we faced while living under Israeli military occupation and Palestinian Authority security occupation, we continue to install geothermal systems and work towards creating a more sustainable economy for Palestine. We're working towards our own solution for Palestine, not the two-state solution, nor the one-state solution, but the green state solution. We dare to establish that the power of an idea combined with creative entrepreneurship is far greater than any obstacle way. In Palestine, in the face of extraordinary challenges, we were able to build sustainably, then every country in the Middle East and North Africa can also build sustainably. My hope is that one day I will arrive to the region to hear them say the word, it's definite, instead of, it's
<laughs> As the people of the region cast off the rusty shackles of tyranny and oppression, so too must they cast off the old paradigms of careless energy consumption and embrace a future of It's time for the Arab green.